All right, so final stretch here the last week and the last chapter I want to talk about. So this continues discussions of um, carbonyl compounds, but in particular we're going to be talking about carboxylic acid derivatives. But just to remind you a little bit about last week's um, uh, discussions about aldehydes and ketones, um, remember that um, carbonyl compounds have a lot of electrophilic character at the carbon. And we can do chemistry where we add nucleophiles to that carbon in a variety of different ways. Um, in general, a lot of these reactions, which are using, I would say, weaker nucleophiles, um, are reversible and can be done under acid or base catalyzed conditions, depending on um, what we need to do to activate this reaction to make it work. So, for example, um, we talked a little bit about how you can protonate a carbonyl compound, uh, like a ketone, with an acid catalyst and generate a positively charged species. That makes the carbonyl compound more electrophilic and more reactive. So weak nucleophiles like water or like alcohols can add. Um, so we can make things like acetals under the exact same type of reactions. Uh, as we do for addition of water, for example. And we can add a lot of other things, as we talked about last week. Um, nitrogen compounds, we can make uh, carbon-nitrogen double bond compounds called imines. We can do all kinds of different things uh, by addition to carbonyls. In these conditions, um, oftentimes under acid catalysis where things are reversible. Um, there are some nucleophiles we add which are essentially not reversible with regards to reactions with aldehydes and ketones. Those are typically strong nucleophiles, like hydride reagents, um, where we're actually reducing the carbonyl compound down to an alcohol with lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride. Or Grignard reagents, where we can also make alcohols by adding carbon nucleophiles. Uh, so in general, that's, I think, the, uh, the type of reactivity um, that I want you to be aware of with regards to um, aldehydes and ketones. But when we talk about carboxylic acids, um, now we have a functional group that contains a carbonyl compound, but which is a little bit different. In terms of the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon, that's going to be highly dependent on what the other substituent is. So now when we talk about the next oxidation state, carboxylic acids, Okay, carboxylic acids have another heteroatom. In addition to the carbonyl, we have an OH group also attached. That does a couple of things. Um, that makes the carbonyl carbon less positively charged. Right? And why is that the case? We talked about this a little bit last week. Why is the carbonyl carbon, the carbon of the double bond and oxygen, less positively charged? Because of resonance, because the lone pair on that additional oxygen substituent can donate and neutralize any charge. So if you think about um, an oxygen derivative like a carboxylic acid, if you think about the resonance form for the carbonyl part, put those electrons up on the oxygen and put that plus charge on the carbon and to look at that resonance form, the lone pairs on these oxygens can donate to that plus charge and create, uh, essentially, we could draw an additional resonance structure, which puts the plus charge now out, the formal plus charge out on the other oxygen. Okay, but notice that plus charge is no longer on the carbonyl when we draw that additional resonance form. So now instead of an aldehyde or ketone where we can draw two resonance forms, uh, when we have an additional substituent, especially one that has good donation ability of that lone pair, uh, we now have a third resonance form, so the plus charge is spread out even further. Okay, and the negative charge is um, out there on the oxygen. So because of that, um, some of these carboxylic acid derivatives, when we have uh, an OH or some of these other derivatives, they're going to be less reactive than aldehydes and ketones. However, not all of them. Some of them are going to be more reactive, actually, and it depends on the nature 
of that substituent. Let me clean this up for you. Depends on the nature of that additional group, which isn't a hydrogen or a carbon. Um, and there are many atoms on the periodic table that you can look at uh, putting into this position. Um, when we are talking about derivatives of carboxylic acids, we're talking about substituents there that are more electronegative than carbon. Typically, these are the main um, derivatives that I've shown here. They could be halogens, acid chlorides, for example, or acid bromides. Um, they could be what we refer to as an anhydride. So notice this is a, a molecule with an oxygen substituent, but with another carbonyl on the other end. It's essentially the anhydride. The term anhydride comes from the fact that an acid anhydride is made up of two molecules of acid where we have lost water. So if you think about how that might have been formed, an acid plus another acid. Okay, if you uh, essentially remove H2O and bind those together, you have essentially the structure of an anhydride. Okay, um, esters, we've seen these before. If it's instead of an OH, it's an O-alkyl or O-something else, or some other carbon. That's what we refer to as an ester functionality. Uh, and nitrogen. These are the main ones that I want to focus on. I know your book talks about some phosphoesters and some other sulfur derivatives, thioesters. Um, but I'm not going to worry about those. I just want to focus on um, these four derivatives um, for the rest of this uh, week. Uh, so this, these functionalities, nitrogen, are amides. So if you look at this range of carboxylic acid derivatives, we have different reactivities. When I'm talking about reactivity, I'm talking about the electrophilic nature of the carbonyl compound, of the carbon. Okay, so if you think about the differences, the, the subtle differences between those groups, the ester, very similar to the carboxylic acid as I just talked about, we have lone pairs on that oxygen which can donate towards that electrophilic carbon. So in general, an ester is going to be less reactive than an aldehyde or ketone. Okay, just like we talked about for OH. The nitrogen, the nitrogen uh, also has a lone pair, and it's, even, it's an even better donor. Nitrogen, if you look on the periodic table, nitrogen is to the left of oxygen. So nitrogen is less electrophilic, or sorry, less electronegative than oxygen. So it's holding on to those electrons a little more loosely. It can donate them better. So nitrogen is actually a very good donor to neutralize that plus charge on the carbon. And so amides are one of the most stable carboxylic acid derivatives. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit later how amides are the, this particular functional group is really the backbone of, of uh, proteins and peptides um, in biological molecules. That bond is actually quite strong, less reactive. Now, if you think about the other two, on the more reactive end, Okay. Why would you expect an acid anhydride to be more reactive than an ester? They're both oxygen there, right? What, what are the properties there that would make you think or, or explain why an anhydride is less reactive than an ester? I'm sorry, more reactive. Make sure I say things right. This reactivity trend has to do with the ability of those lone pairs on a substituent to donate towards the carbonyl carbon. Okay, the more donation you have towards the carbonyl carbon of those lone pairs, the less reactive it is. So if you have an OCH3, that lone pair can donate pretty well. If you have this oxygen, which has 
lone pairs on it, that can donate towards that carbonyl. But there's also another carbonyl group over here, which is polarized in that direction. So it's pulling the electrons the other direction as well. So it's actually those, those lone pairs are actually pulled in both directions. So they're not donating to one side as readily as if the other carbonyl wasn't there. Make sense? So we think about an anhydride now, this, this group as an electron withdrawing group, uh, making this a little more reactive. And the halides, the chlorides, these are the most reactive of the carboxylic acid derivatives because the halides aren't great lone pair donors, uh, but they're really electronegative. And so they are really pulling electron density towards it. Okay, just like alkyl halides. Alkyl halides are reactive because the carbon chlorine bond, carbon bromine bonds are polarized, right? And the same is true here, that carbon chlorine bond is still polarized. So that um, is pulling the electrons away from the carbonyl carbon, and the oxygen is also pulling electrons away from the carbonyl carbon. So this, this carbon is actually one of the more reactive carbonyl derivatives. More reactive than aldehydes and ketones, actually. So nucleophiles react very readily. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the chemistry of those derivatives this week, um, where the difference between an aldehyde and a ketone, where if you have, say, a ketone and you add a nucleophile, whatever nucleophile we're adding, we end up, after protonation, getting... The addition of the nucleophile breaking the bond. Okay, the difference is if you, well, let me make this a minus charge before protonation. The difference is if you have some group which could actually leave, that negative charge can come back down and kick off a leaving group. So the thing about the chlorine or anhydride or even esters and amides under the right conditions is you can actually substitute, you can substitute this group for something else. I'll just say uh, some group Z. You can do a nucleophilic substitution of those groups. What we refer to as a nucleophilic acyl substitution. Where does that term come from? Well, because the, that is an acyl group. Okay, so let's, let's uh, take a look at uh, these derivatives and some of the ways in which we refer to them. Probably one of the functional groups which has uh, the most common names associated with it, besides aromatic uh, common names, are probably carboxylic <coughs> acids. And we've seen some of these along the way. The two-carbon acid is referred to as acetic acid, uh, the acid of vinegar, acetic acid. Um, but the actual IUPAC formal name would be taking the parent chain, two carbons would be ethane, and you drop the E and then add the OIC <coughs> ending to it, uh, and then pass the word acid. So it's an ethanoic acid. This would be how we would name that compound. The one carbon acid, methanoic acid, uh, commonly called formic acid. This is an acid which is found um, in ants, actually. I don't know if you've ever tasted an ant. People do eat them. They're a little sour tasting because of formic acid in them. Um, you can have more than one acid functional group in a molecule. Uh, and there are many acids which have the two carboxylic acid groups on either end of chains, and there's a, a whole bunch of common names associated with the various chain length differences. This happens to be the six carbon chain, hexane dioic acid, referring to two acids. So there's a carboxylic acid group there and there. But commonly referred to as adipic acid. I know, these names just come out of nowhere. I don't even know the origin of adipic acid. Actually, that's a really important acid industrially. 
Anybody know what azithic acid is used for? There's a polymer uh, that's made from an acid, uh, actually this, this particular dye acid, and a particular diamine compound, the six carbon, and this could be various lengths. Oops, I missed one carbon. So if you take the six carbon diamine compound and condense that with the six carbon diacid compound, you end up making amide bonds and making long polymer chains of amide six carbons between the next amide and then the next amide. That's referred to as a polyamide. And this uh, happens to be, uh, this particular combination happens to be nylon 6-6. Six six. So these polymers of polyamides are referred to as nylons. So everybody has heard the word nylon, right? There are probably lots of nylon out there right now. Um, the numbers for the nylon dictate the, the chain lengths of the acid part, the diacid part, and the diamine part. And you can make different, different kinds of nylons with different properties depending on the sizes of those chains. Um, so acids, uh, we've seen a few others. We've seen benzoic acid, the common name for this. Now, when we use um, an acid group as sort of an addition uh, to it, we use this term carboxylic acid, which is referring to that whole group, the carbon with the two oxygens and hydrogen. So when I, benzoic acid could be called benzene carboxylic acid. Because benzene, the word benzene only includes the six carbons of the ring. Carboxylic acid would then include the carbon of the acid group. Okay. Now, people would just use benzoic acid because benzoic acid is so common. Um, but when you have um, carboxylic acid groups attached to other things like ring compounds, it's a little bit harder to use a parent name beyond the size of the ring to include the carbon of the carboxylic acid. So this, the way where this is used mostly is in a name like this. So this is cyclopentane carboxylic acid. And so the carboxylic acid part of that name is including the carbon of the carboxylic acid, which is different than the names above. See, hexane dioic acid, it includes in the hexane part the carbons of the carboxylic acid. Or ethanoic acid is that ethane is referring to both of those carbons, the two carbon group, and the oic acid means the acid functionality is on the end carbon of the ethane. That's the difference between including that within the name of the parent or including it as an addition to the parent carbon. Okay, so that's a little bit about naming of the acids. Uh, we also have lots of different namings based often on some of these common names for a variety of derivatives as well. Um, your book lists this chart. This, is, this only begins to scratch the surface of all of the various common names for um, uh, various acids. Uh, so they just listed a few here. Formic and acetic acid we just talked about. Um, propionic acid and butyric acid. Though that's actually a common name. Although it's a little bit uh, more straightforward because the prop, of course, refers to three carbons and the but refers to four carbons. But notice those are a little bit different. How would you actually name that three carbon acid in, in the IUPAC name? Propionic isn't quite the correct according to our naming rules. Neither is butyric. Propanoic, that's right. The actual name would be propanoic. So you, we see some of these propanoic acid. You see some of these uh, common names, especially for the smaller um, carbon chain acids. Butyric would be butanoic. 
Okay, that's the actual official name, butanoic acid. Butyric acid is a common name that's just been adopted and used quite a bit. So you'll see some of these, and then there's a, a you know, as you as you look at the diacids, there's a whole bunch of common names for the various diacids. Some of which you might have um, uh, heard before. Oxalic acid is an acid found like in rhubarb has a lot of oxalic acid. Malonic acid is the three carbon. The four carbon is succinic, uh, glutaric, adipic. We just talked about, and so on. And there's actually others as well. I'm not going to have you memorize all these common names. I don't think it's worthwhile, but I just want you to be aware if you see that, that those are common names um, that you should, if you need to know, you can look up. Acrylic acid, malic acid, different uh, acids with different functional groups. They actually have common names for the cis and, and the trans isomer, which would, wouldn't seem to be related at all, but they're just stereoisomers of each other, malic and fumaric acid, um, benzoic acid we've talked about. Now, when we talk about these as groups on something, we've seen that, and we've seen uh, um, an acid group called an acyl, acyl group in a general form, an acyl group. So if you have a, a substituent of a two carbon group with um, a carbonyl, that would be an acetyl group, or a propionyl group would be three carbon, a butyryl, etc. And, and some of those are also named based on those common names. Benzoyl would refer to the benzene with a carbon double bond oxygen then attached to something else. Okay, so that's some of the most common ones. Uh, when we think about naming the derivatives, Sometimes, it depends on the specific carboxylic acid derivative that we're talking about. Um, there are different ways to name different derivatives. So for the acid halides, um, we use that acyl group name and then follow it by the particular halogen that is attached. So uh, in the common name, acetic acid, that would be an acetyl group. And the acid chloride from acetic acid would be acetyl chloride. Some people pronounce it acetyl, but uh, it's a little confusing. Acetyl chloride. The actual IUPAC name, since that's a two carbon group from ethanoic acid, ethanoic acid, uh, do you know what the substituent name would be for? an eth ethan uh, or an acetyl group based on the ethane it would be you drop the e from ethane and use oyl so it would be ethanoyl chloride Um, OYL is the name for the acyl groups. Notice a lot of the common names sometimes don't use the O. Acetyl, etc. Uh, but we do see that show up in the benzoic acid derivative, benzoyl. This is a benzoyl group. So if you have a benzoyl halide, um, it's like in this case, benzoyl bromide is the name for that. And if you use carboxylic acid, like cyclohexane carboxylic acid, it's cyclohexane carbonyl chloride. That makes sense, right? This is a carbonyl group. Carbonyl chloride. Okay, so that's how we name the acid halides. The anhydrides are named based on the acids that made up the, the two sides of the anhydride group. The functional group is a carbonyl, oxygen carbonyl, but those groups could be the same. The rest of the molecule could be the same on both sides, meaning they were made from the same acid and you lost water. Or they could be different. Um, most of them are made from the same acid and are symmetric. And so you just refer to the acid that made it, like acetic 
acid would be one half of that. Um, the anhydride from acetic acid is acetic anhydride. Or benzoic anhydride. Or you can even have the cyclic. From succinic acid is the five carbon, uh, sorry, that's four carbon diacid. And if those two acid ends come together and you lose water, it's the succinic anhydride, the anhydride of succinic acid. Again, that's also symmetric. Um, when you have more than one acid, uh, two, two different acids forming an anhydride, you just name both sides. So in this case, acetic acid would the source for the left side, benzoic acid for the right. It's referred to as acetic benzoic anhydride. Not too hard, right? Does that help better? Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> ester derivatives. When we talk about ester derivatives, esters are named based on the parent would be from the carboxylic acid, but we use an ATE ending to refer to uh, what we would think about as the anion. So if you think about acetic acid, so if we think about acetic acid, okay, and then you were to think about taking the proton off of acetic acid, that would be an acetate, the acetate ion, okay, or ethanoate if you want to use the actual formal name. Ethanoic acid, that's the ethanoate anion. Okay, so when we talk about naming esters, where instead of an OH we have some alkyl group or some other carbon group, we put the name of the carbon group as a substituent in front of the name, and then use this eight naming uh, system for the acid part. So this is ethyl group attached to an acetate. So ethyl acetate, which is a common solid. Uh, same thing if we have a diacid, you have two ester groups on either end, that's malonic acid. So there are two methyl groups, it's dimethyl malonate. Okay, if they were different, what if I had uh, methyl and then I had over here an ethyl group? How do you think that would be named? Any idea? That's right. Ethyl, very easy. Ethyl for one of the groups, methyl, malonate. Okay, and that can be combined with however we've named the carboxylic acid. So cyclohexane carboxylic acid, or cyclohexane carboxylate now, if you think about the anion of that, with a, an alkyl group. This happens to be a tertiary butyl group. So that's, how, that's what gives rise to namings of various esters. We name the substituent on the oxygen, and then we use the 8 or O8 uh, ending for the acid of the parent. Okay? Esters. Amides. Amides are a little more complicated because we have uh, the ability to have NH2 or any number of up to two other substituents on the nitrogen. Um, the simplest ones, of course, just have hydrogens on those nitrogens. And we simply call those, uh, we drop the E ending from the parent chain, hexane, we drop the E and add amide to the end. So hexanamide is the six carbon amide with NH2 from hexanoic acid. Okay, and we would do that with any of the IUPAC acid name or um, the common name. So 
Uh, acetic acid, we drop the IC ending from acetic acid and it's a set amid to refer to the NH2 group. Okay, so if we have then substituents attached on the nitrogen instead of hydrogens, if we have alkyl groups, for example, we have to name those and we also have to say where they're at. There is no number. The numbers for the molecule would be along the carbon backbone. So uh, we have to say that the group that we're talking about is attached to the nitrogen. And what we do is we just simply put an N in front of the substituent, meaning it's attached to the nitrogen. So N-methyl propanamide for this particular molecule. As opposed to um, this one, this one would be, how would you name this molecule? Well, we have a three carbon propane, propanoic acid with an amide group, and a methyl group on the carbon number two. So it's two methyl propanamide. Okay. Notice the only difference between these names is N versus two, the position of the methyl group. So we use N to say that it's on the nitrogen. Okay. Uh, there are two groups, N and diethyl, happens to be identical groups, so we can just use diethyl. Or if it's a methyl and ethyl, you'd say N-methyl, N-ethyl, cyclohexane carboxamide. Okay? Um, so that's amides. We just have to pay attention to any substituents on the nitrogen uh, that we need to account for by using the N in the name. Okay, another um, acid derivative, which I didn't mention in, the, in the, those four acid derivatives, is slightly different, but it has the same oxidation state as a carboxylic acid, and that's a nitrile. That's a CN triple bond. It doesn't have oxygen attached, but there are three bonds to a more electronegative atom, namely the nitrogen. Uh, so a, a CN is called what we refer to as a nitrile. So these are um, nitriles, and the names um, associated with that is to just add the word nitrile to the end of the name. Notice we didn't even drop the E because nitrile starts with a consonant. It would sound funny. Um, so pentane nitrile would be the five carbon, including the carbon of the CN triple bond. Okay, so that part, uh, that parent name includes the carbon and that nitrile carbon is carbon one. Okay, notice that's different than this one, which is um, has the word carbonitrile, because cyclohexane, the parent, doesn't include that carbon of the nitrile. So we have to add carbo in front of it to include that, that, that carbon. Okay, and you see a lot of similarities. Acetonitrile from acetic acid, benzonitrile from benzoic acid. Ethane nitrile would be the two carbon um, nitrile compound. These are uh, pretty unreactive groups relative to, say, other groups. So I would say somewhere closer to the amide in terms of reactivity. Uh, pretty stable. However, they can be one of the nice things about nitriles. Uh, is that they can be converted into the carboxylic acid under strong hydrolysis conditions. You can add water to it and actually make the amide or even go further all the way to the acid. So they're a source for acid. Um, and just as a little bit of an aside, one of the things that nitriles are very, very good precursors for carboxylic acids is because we can use them we can use cyanide as a good nucleophile to introduce a carbon with the right oxidation state and convert it into a carboxylic acid later. It's one of the nice ways we have to prepare carboxylic acids. 
Okay, so that's um, pretty much it for naming. I want to talk a little bit more about the properties of carboxylic acids. Um, I mentioned that we have a CO double bond, so we have this, some of the same properties that we had with other carbonyl derivatives like aldehydes and ketones. That is, we have an electrophilic carbon to some extent, not quite as reactive as aldehydes and ketones. We still have this carbonyl oxygen, which can be protonated, okay, which actually has a significant amount of negative charge. So here is partially negative. Um, the carbonyl carbon is partially positive, but also this is acidic, right? They wouldn't be called acids if they weren't acidic. So the proton uh, can come off by gradually. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we see with carboxylic acids is that relative to, say, the alcohol or the aldehyde, with the same number of carbons, they have much higher boiling points. And that's because they tend to uh, dimerize together through hydrogen bonding, like is shown here. So the hydrogen, acidic hydrogen, interacts with the negative charge of the carbonyl. Okay, and so the and then the other carbonyl negative charge interacts, forms hydrogen bonding with the hydrogen of the other acid. Okay, this this is a relatively strong attraction. Uh, more so than just the hydrogen bonding we talked about in water and alcohol, because now each molecule has two interactions. Okay, so that has a tendency to uh, make them higher boiling relative to other similar molecular weight compounds. Um, and also demonstrates the fact that these carboxylic acids are acidic. So you can deprotonate them with the right base. Okay, and they don't have to be that strong of a base. So we can make the carboxylates pretty readily. Or with a suitably strong acid, particularly when we start to talk about some of the acid derivatives, not the OH, the carbonyl oxygen can be protonated pretty readily. So uh, carboxylic acids. Um, we can do all kinds of things with them. We can form a variety of different compounds from carboxylic acids. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, esters for a moment um, because I think there's a lot of interesting things about esters. One of the things is that um, they, they tend to, especially these smaller esters, uh, like I've shown here, a couple of these examples, methyl butanoate, that is the methyl ester of but uh, butyric acid or carbon acid actually is found in pineapples. And a lot of these small esters are very aromatic and have um, uh, wonderful fruit sort of aromas and flavors and are found in those fruits. So this happens to be the one from pineapple. The acetate, the two carbon acid group with this five carbon isomer of pentane attached, which is commonly referred to as isopentyl acetate, just the smell of bananas. And in the fragrance industry, and actually in the fruit flavoring industries, they make these synthetically for adding to various uh, food products. I remember when I was in, in high school, we actually uh, did an organic chemistry lab, and they said, make any ester you want. And everyone was making all these wonderful smelling esters. And I picked the wrong ones, and I made ethyl acetate. And it smelled like nail polish over. That was so fun. Um, Biologically, I think one important um, ester compound are fats. Okay, fats are esters. Uh, you might not know that. So this, this I've just shown an R group here, but this R group on these um, these uh, esters are long carbon chains. Okay, lots of hydrocarbons. That's why fats are oils, are non-water soluble. But they happen to be attached to uh, this, this three carbon triol called glycerol. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Glycerol, uh, so each glycerol can hold three ester groups or three carboxylic acids attached to it. So a fat um, that you know of and, and know a little bit about, hopefully, about the nutrition of fats, 
uh, look like this. This belongs to a, a, a larger class of compounds we call lipids. Lipids are hydrocarbon-based fats or, or compounds, which include those fats, those triesters. Uh, you might have heard the term triglyceride, right? Triglyceride. That's glycerol is that triol. Um, but other things as well, waxes, um, even some of the greasy hydrocarbon uh, hormones like like um, cholesterol, for example, I've shown here, it happens to be mostly hydrocarbon, also very greasy and tends to stick in where there's nonpolar fatty regions in tissues and in cells. So, for example, if we think about the difference between a wax and a fat, a wax is, is two long carbon chains which has one ester group connecting them. So this happens to be from beeswax. One of the waxes from beeswax with this long, one side has the alcohol side has 30 carbons and the acid side has 16 carbons in this particular one. Um, fats. Fats, as I said, um, are based on three of these long chain, what we call fatty acids an acid group on the end of a long carbon chain, um, and this glycerol. This can be hydrolyzed as well. So you can actually um, make the triglyceride or the fat from the alcohol and the acids, and your body does this in biosynthetic pathways. Um, or you can hydrolyze it, as shown here. You can take a fat, an oil, uh, and hydrolyze it or add water across that so you get back the alcohol that was attached and the individual carboxylic acids. Which is a very useful thing. Okay? And to give you some idea about these particular fatty acids, okay, but you know there's all kinds of different oils and fats we talk about. And you might have heard of some of these saturated fats have these substituents all as sp3 hybridized carbons, just alkane groups, long alkane chains. So for example, stearic acid is one. What is that? I think this one's 18 carbons. That's stearic acid. Notice it's just all alkane, sp3 carbons. And if you look at um, a saturated fat, now remember this acid, there would be three of these, or sometimes there are different groups on the same glycerol, but three of those attached to a glycerol, and then those um, are either liquids, what we refer to as oils, or solids, which we often use fat instead of oil. Oh, they're all fats. Um, but saturated fats are solid, right? Butter is mostly saturated fats. Um, Crisco, shortening is another kind of saturated fat. But notice how regular um, that carbon chain is and with an alkane, right? The, the lowest energy conformation is the one where it's all uh, zigzag like that. And notice that chain is quite straight. Okay, so they, what that happens is they pack together really well. And so they form, at room temperature, those fats tend to be solids. Not so good when they're clogging your arteries. Um, we've heard of unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats are simply that. They're fats that have double bonds in them. One or more, there are a lot of different kinds of fats. Here's one particular example. And notice what happens when you in introduce some unsaturation into these fatty acid chains. It is no longer straight, it's kinked. Okay, so here's the acid that I've shown here, carboxylic acid. Here is a double bond. Notice if it's a cis double bond, it kinks it like this. And here's another double bond, which is also a cis double bond. Most of the natural and saturated fats, not all, there are some trans double bonds, but most of them are cis double bonds. And these fats tend to be uh, oils because they don't pack together well in the solid form. Okay. 
Um, and those double bonds offer some pathways for metabolism as well. They can be oxidized and undergo different reactions. Now, you've heard of partially hydrogenated fats, right? So the, if you can take these, what they do is they take these oils with double bonds and they add hydrogen, just like how we've shown in this class to reduce a double bond. Do you remember how they do that? How do we add H2 to a double bond? Hydrogenation using a, a palladium catalyst or some other metal catalyst. They do that with oils. And, and that's so they can take oils and partially hydrogenate them or fully hydrogenate them to make the saturated fats. But what happens is not all of the double bonds get hydrogenated and in that process they go from cis to trans, which is the more stable, right? So if they're partially hydrogenated, we end up with fatty acids in those oils, which have still have double bonds, so they still have some reactivity. Uh, but they're also now solids because they pack together well. The trans, notice the trans double bond here and here. It looks a lot like a saturated fat in its shape. Okay, so, so shortening is partially hydrogenated oils that have been made solid by forming them into structures similar to this. Now they're not so good for your bodies because um, they, uh, they are similar to, actually they're worse than saturated fats because of the reactivities of those double bonds do other things and uh, cause problems. So if you're interested at all about what those terms meant for the things we eat, um, this hopefully gives you a little bit of insight. Well, esters, as I said, um, fats also are important for another reason, um, and that is this reaction, which is the hydrolysis, or what is often referred to as um, saponification. You take these, you take an oil, and you saponify it. Saponification means to treat it with a base, sodium hydroxide or lye. That's lye, sodium hydroxide. Um, and you probably know that in the old cookbooks, you take you, when you when you um, slaughtered your pig or whatever, you got the lard and you cooked that up with wood ashes, ashes from the fireplace. Those ashes contain um, potash or bases or lye. And you cook that up and you hydrolyze that lard and you get out the salts of those fatty acids. So notice there are, these would all be like sodium salts, plus glycerol. And that is soap. Um, saponified fat is soap. And the way soap works, the way that soap cleans things is because of these long fatty acid chains um, are hydrophobic. They're greasy, but the negatively charged carboxylate ends are water soluble. So what they do is they form these spheres where all the, all the hydrocarbon part is pointed inside the sphere. That's hydrocarbon organic. And on the outside are all of the negative charges, which are water soluble. And most soils and things that are dirt is held on because of grease and oil that's holding them onto your clothing or to your skin or whatever. The soaps form these micelles where those oils get dissolved inside and then become water soluble because the outside of the sphere is negatively charged. That's the, uh, what we would to as a micelle. And that's how soaps clean. Detergents are synthetic soaps. They don't have carboxylates. They have other, other kinds of polar end groups, but just similar kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about soap. By the way, um, glycerol, there's another name for glycerol, and that's called glycerin. So you might have noticed if you, if you go to the um, Bed Bath and Beyond or something, you can buy all these wonderful soaps with various perfumes added and things like that. Um, but and when you use soaps, they tend to dry out your skin, right? So that you can buy skin moisturizers to help moisturize your skin. And those skin moisturizers contain glycerol, glycerin, because that's actually a moisturizer. 
the soap on its own dries out your skin. So when, when, your, when your grandma was out on the prairie making soap from the lard of the pig, she never separated the glycerol from the, from the salts. So both were there. So those soaps were actually much better for your skin. The soap industry had a better idea. They separate these and they sell the soap and knowing it'll dry out your skin so that they can then sell this separately to re-moisturize your skin. And marketing thing. So a surfactant um, is, is like a soap, um, but it's not a carboxylic acid end. It's something else, some other polarized group. It could be a, um, oftentimes surfactants have long carbon chains like this, but have an SO3 minus end instead of a CO2 minus end. So surfactants, similar kinds of things, yes. Detergents have phosphates on the ends. But they all have the same concept. Um, forming micelles in water solutions. Okay, um, just a, a couple more slides I want to talk about here about these fatty acids and the biology of course. They're super important because it's those fatty acid uh, esters which form cell membranes. And so actually inside the cell it's water and outside the cell is water. And so what happens is it's kind of like taking a micelle, but then taking those, those uh, ends that have charges and the fatty groups, putting the fatty groups together. So outside the cell is water, inside the cell is water. It's polar here, but nonpolar in the cell membrane. And that's what keeps the cells together. Um, and those so-called phosphoglycerides are made from the fats to form those cell membranes, but what the difference is, it doesn't have three, doesn't have three fatty acids on that glycerol uh, molecule. It has two fatty acids that form the interior of the cell membrane, but then the polar group is that group. That's why the phosphoglyceride. It's this phosphate with this ethanolamine group attached um, as the polar surface of those cell membranes. So these, these esters, these esters are critical uh, for our cells and for them to be intact. Okay, and uh, carboxylic acids, we've talked about um, acid strength and PPA before, so just to remind you that based on the electronegativity of groups, the ability of delocalization, um, whether you have electron donating or electron withdrawing, all of that affects the acidity uh, and the pKa's of carboxylic acid. So you can see here some examples. Um, acetic acid has a pKa of 4.75. If you put a fluorine group on it, it goes down to about 2.6. Put three fluorine groups on it, it goes down even more. So the electronegativity Anything that can stabilize the negative charge after the proton comes off, that'll make it easier for the proton to come off as a carbon, and that will then be more acidic. Same thing with donating groups versus withdrawing groups on benzene. So nitro group is a strong electron withdrawing group. The OH is more acidic. It's because the negative charge form is more stabilized. Electron donating group will destabilize negative charge. So we soon see some effects of that as well. That's a little bit about um, acid strength uh, to give you some idea about carboxylic acids relative to alcohols and water, which are around 16. These are significantly more acidic just by nature of the carbonyl group and delocalization of the negative charge of the carboxylate. Okay. Um, I want to take a quiz now. On Thursday, we're going to talk about the nucleophilic substitution reactions of acid derivatives, uh, and then uh, we'll finish up some of Chapter 10. We're not going to cover all of those reactions of Chapter 10, and I've made the homework. I've made a lot, of, like the second half of the homework, is optional uh, because we're not going to cover all of those reactions in detail. We're just going to cover some general.